I mean, we're supporting local producers, right? I mean, if we, you know, get in touch with local ranchers, buy directly from the farmer. I mean, that's really, that's really our best bet. Uh, people, not everybody needs to grow their own food, right? Like I, I enjoy, you know, I enjoy having animals, you know, every morning I get to get up and, and milk the cockroaches, you know, um, no, <laughs> we, we, we've got, we've got cows. So, you know, every morning I get to wake up, milk some cows and, you know, that, that gives us, I don't know, we get like five gallons of milk a day, we got a good amount of food there that we can turn into cheese, yogurt, trade for other foods, right? We've got chickens, ducks, um, we got swine now, we got two pigs, we just got, we just got pregnant, and um, oh, sheep as well. So I, I enjoy this, but not everybody has the ability to, not everybody lives in a place where they can, not everybody should live in a place where they can necessarily, uh, but we can, we can support local producers. Well, I guess you're still hiding out in Ecuador. Is that, I mean, not hiding out, but is that, is that still where you're at? Still in Literally the- hiding oh. out. Yeah. No, I'm like at a top, I'm at a top secret location. Um, you know, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we came down to Ecuador in 2010 and I've been, I've been back to the States two times since 2010. Um, it travels a little bit. The last couple of years travel has been not so uh, inviting <laughs> to say the least. So yeah, we've, I've not left Ecuador in the last almost nine years. Wow. Interesting. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, well, talk, you know, obviously, I mean, I, 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 I think the, the events of the last two years have, have at least caused some people to question some things and some of the things that I, I would imagine perhaps sort of the interest in what you've been talking to has increased. Is that fair to say? You got more people that are kind of checking out what you've been talking about, or I don't know what the, I know the censorship stuff has been pretty outrageous, particularly with, you know, YouTube channel and stuff. Is that, are you getting quite a bit of people interested in what, what you've been talking about over the last few years? Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this before, you know, I was, I was, I was trying to remember, I don't ex- remember the exact uh, topics that we hit on, on the last talk, but I think this was at the beginning of 2020. Uh, and I know that, I know you do the first part of this to YouTube. So I'm, I'm going to try to, you know, we always got to dance around certain words here, um, unfortunately. And, um, you know, I think, I think the last conversation we had, if I remember correctly, I was hitting heavily on the concept of digital identity, a consolidated global digital identification system that would be rolled out in response to this, uh, passports that are behavior based, if you know what I mean. Um, the, you know, medical behavior being the, the door to open, um, ultimately to more of a social credit style system. So yeah, man, I mean, I've been, I've been kind of hitting hard on this for a few years. I know like maybe it was three years ago when I went on your previous, uh, I don't know if you still do human performance outliers. Do you still use that? Yeah. Are you still- I don't know. I mean, Zach, Zach does that by himself. I think, uh, you know, we just, we just ran out of, I just ran out of time to do both. And so, but uh, yeah. yeah, we talked about a little bit of that. Yeah, I remember coming I on there like a few years ago, and that was, it was funny because we, you know, we we did talk about all this stuff kind of before the, you know, the the global event <laughs> that happened that kind of catalyzed all of this. And that, yeah, it's interesting how it's all kind of it really has come to a head, man. And I think more people are getting interested in this, but the censorship, like you said, has been a major deterrent to actually being able to speak about these things on major platforms. Unfortunately, yeah. where where do you where do you find that you're able to discuss and speak freely? You feel or I don't know. I mean, you know, it's kind of creepy when you get on the Zoom call and it says this meeting is being recorded. And, you know, apparently I don't know how protected Zoom is, quite honestly. I'm sure there's people listening to various conversations. But yeah, it's it's such a weird thing to even have to think about. Right. But, um, you know, I mean, as far as like digital technology goes, I think all of these all of these any, any devices we have, you know, I've, got, I've got friends that kind of like helped to build some of the infrastructure that we all use. And they all laugh when people talk about using VPNs and stuff <laughs> like, like VPN, you know, like not, basically any, any digital um, device we're using as you know, the back doors and stuff. So, but as, as far as being able to speak freely, you know, publicly about certain issues, uh, I think, I think YouTube, I mean, it's obvious. I know you've been dealing with this. You got some kind of, uh, I don't know, some, some strikes and whatnot recently. Thank, thankfully you're still on YouTube. Yeah, I've got two, I've got two strikes. I had four strikes since August. So, I mean, there's like a three month window. And so it's kind of like, you know, it's like you're teetering the edge. And so I think my, 
my uh, most recent hire is on March 3rd. And so I have to sort of be very mindful of that. And then, and then, and then the next one will expire, I think, in, I don't know, the end of March or something like that. And so hopefully get back to zero. And I don't know, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of, and it's absolutely ridiculous, the stuff that, that, that led to these strikes. I mean, I was just like, this is the most ridiculous nonsense. You know, all this stuff that has now been shown to be true, uh, you, know, you know, like you said, the conspiracy theories are basically uh, spoiler spoiler alerts is what they've turned out to be, right? You know, it's kind of like uh, uh, interesting. I want to ask you, um, so in Canada, obviously, we just saw the, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau kind of smacking down the, the people that wanted, that, that oppose him politically, I suppose, more than anything. Um, and, and their finance minister, I'm not sure who has announced that they were going to be confiscating people's bank accounts. And so and what do you say? I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty clear to most people that this pandemic is largely over in, in many people's eyes, even, even though the, the, the most bluest of blue states are now waking up and seeing their political careers on, the, you know, they're, they're seeing the political science on the, on the wall, right? The political science has changed, right? So now it's expedient to, to get rid of this stuff. But, you know, this, this concern about, you know, what about our money? You know, what are your thoughts on that? What, what's going to remain? What, what did they install that they, they're going to keep that's going to be... Uh, problematic for us and uh, you know maybe i don't know how what you've seen around mm. the world or yeah that's that's a really relevant topic man i mean we've been seeing you know what we what we talked about in the last two times that you and i you know did something on your platform uh was one of the, one of the major endpoints of a lot of these things uh as i've kind of been telling people for years now uh no, I'm not, I don't like, I don't think I have some, I don't have some special insight. I mean, this is just, this is, it's been pretty obvious to me that these things were coming. It's not like I have some, you know, like super secret sauce or something. I mean, it's just, you know, looking at the trends, reading white papers from some of these global corporations, reading the writings of some of the major thought leaders. I mean, in the last one we talked two years ago, I was talking about Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum, um, and their, you know, the, the Great Reset language which is basically just the rebranding of surveillance capitalism it's um uh what we're looking at is more akin to i mean the chinese social credit system is a really is a window into what is being rolled out worldwide and we have to remember you know china communist china this is this is a playground for big tech uh big tech helped to build the infrastructure uh, for the social credit system, which is essentially a system of digital control uh, with behavior modification gateways, uh, QR code scanners everywhere to where, you know, you're, you're, you're tracked and traced. Everything you do, everything you say can be used to influence, say, your, your credit score, right? And we've even seen this. The IMF announced, I think it was two years ago, they said, well, maybe we should have some sort of a way to determine people's uh, credit rating using their internet search history, right? So, I mean, this is uh, what we're looking at with a lot of the tech that's being rolled out is essentially, it's like a Pavlovian Skinner box culture. And I mean, it, 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 sounds, it sounds extreme, but I think the last two years have really shown people just what extent uh, mass media and governments are willing to... Uh, the lengths that they're willing to go to terrorize people um, into submission and consumption patterns that are desired. So I think what we're going to be seeing is um, more direct tie-ins of your behavior with um, economic incentives and essentially like Pavlovian control mechanisms, right? You say the wrong thing, you interact with the wrong people, you, uh, you know, you made a post on your Facebook in 2009, that was a little bit outside of the social norms that the regime wishes to, uh, wishes to enforce, then you are going to receive a lower social credit score. And in order to get back, you will have to prove your good global citizenship by, uh, you know, shout out to our sponsors, Oatly and um, uh, Raytheon's Cockroach Milk, you know, we've, we, you know, you're gonna have to, you have to consume the, the, the right products and, and, and profess the right beliefs to even be a part of commerce. Now we're not there yet, but this is, this is what this is driving towards. And I'm not saying this is inevitably has to happen and that this control grid will get to that point. You know, you see like the Soviet union, nobody really thought that it was going to fall, you know, 1989, 1990, it was a sudden crash, right? It kind of fell under the weight of its own 
of its own um, inadequacy. So, you know, I, I don't think that this is inevitable and this has to happen, but this is the direction that they're going with stakeholder capitalism, so-called great reset. It's like a, it's like the worst aspects of communism, the worst aspects of fascism. It's global corporate governance. It's, um, it's essentially monopoly. It's global monopoly over everything, you know, through these holding companies, these corporate entities like BlackRock, um, uh, uh, Vanguard, uh, which, which are essentially the same company. They own each other's stock. They own stock in Big Pharma. They own stock in uh, the you know, def defense corporations, Raytheon, Boeing, and all these companies. You look at the ownership of these, and they have been consolidated to a great extent over the last, since like 2008, especially. I mean, this goes back further. Um, you mentioned communist China, the Maoist revolution. You know, th these were funded. <laughs> you know, the Bolshevik revolution was funded uh, infamously, you know, Schiff, you know, there was huge influx of money from Western banking that helped to bankroll Trotsky that helped to, I mean, Trotsky went to the, from, from Trotsky spent a lot of time in, in, in Canada, <laughs> full circle back to just Justin Castro's um, Canada. We've got, you know, the Bolshevik revolution directly tied to, you know, funding from Western banks, funding from uh, Br British oligarchs, Western oligarchs. Um, and, yeah, what we're looking at is a consolidation of power, of economic power using capitalism, monopoly capitalism is what kind of what the uh, the term would probably be, although it's almost like in our economic, in our, in our worldview as Americans, we don't even have a word <laughs> for like this system that's being built because it is so, we're so far removed, I think, uh, in, our, in our economic political thought that it, it, be, it becomes difficult to even put our finger on what we're really seeing here with this kind of global consolidation of power. And I guess monopoly, you know, global monopoly would be a good word for it. I mean, but it's all, kind of always been, you know, the same, you know, whether we were in feudal times and we have all these serfs under these, you know, the small minority that has all the wealth and all the power. I mean, it's, it's just kind of reshuffling the deck, isn't it? I mean, it's just, you know, at, at some point we're all kind of the underlings and, They'll say, well, you know, you're even though you're a, you're basically effectively a serf, you live pretty comfortably compared to uh, other people, and you should just shut up and take it. And and we we can just kind of do this. <laughs> you own nothing and be happy. <laughs> the Klaus Schwab's. Yeah, but I mean, Klaus Schwab's not going to own nothing, right? I mean, Bill Gates is not going to own nothing. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we might, you know, we might get a little, you know, whatever, thousand square feet of luxury box, you know, you know, complete with a uh, cockroach milk. You know replication replicator in our, in our house or something like that but, uh, what do you think um i mean you know obviously a lot of people have, have said this is kind of crazy this is nonsense you know we see all these Klaus schwab memes and you know all the all i mean you, you see it's pretty it's pretty uh, uh, vicious what you see on social media people just you know going after these guys and, and, and more and more people cheering on that but are, is, is that having an effect do you think do you think there's there's a do you think these guys, I mean, you see the politicians walking backwards, you know, backstepping away from that. And, you know, we see all that, you know, like you look at the, the young leaders, the World Economic Forum young leaders, you know, body, whatever. And you see all these guys that are like, you know, Macron and Trudeau and, and Gavin Newsom and Biden and, you know, Jacinda Ardern and Dan Andrews, all these people that have been just incredibly, um, you know, on the same page. You know, they have the same sort of what many people would consider a tyrannical outlook. Um, do you think there's going to be a pushback against that in a significant way that can make a difference? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I mean, what, what we're seeing right now with, I mean, uh, Trudeau, I was almost all every time I almost accidentally said Castro. Um, I mean, it's, it started as a joke, but I think if people look into Justin Trudeau's family, it's it's an interesting thing. But um I think we are seeing a significant pushback with the, uh, you know, the truckers. I think, um, you know, that I'm not sure how expected this was. You look back at 2020 in the beginning of this, and we had Klaus Schwab saying, it will be a much angrier world. The world will become a much angrier world. We will get rid of the gray economy and people will be angry at the mechanization of their jobs. You had, you had this plan. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a surprise to people in, you know, global think tanks, uh, that you will see pushback. And when you look at like the Rockefeller's 2010 document, which has the chapter on uh, lockstep, 
So the, a lot of people have talked about this the last year or so. Um, I covered it on my channel and it's on my Rockfin, which, um, you know, if you, if again, just throwing, throwing this one out there, the YouTube, I'm not able to talk about a lot of stuff, but I do have a Rockfin channel. Rockfin is pretty, pretty open to, uh, completely open. They've never told me that, you know, you, Hey, you can't say this, you can't say that. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're not trying to get, trying to get Rockfin in trouble or anything, you know, even, even for YouTube, I never break the terms of services. It's kind of ridiculous that I've received strikes and, you know, uh, shadow, ban shadow banning type stuff, but you can find a lot of the stuff on my Rockfin. That's R-O-K-F-I-N. Um, and there's premium content there as well. But um, yeah, I mean, I've been talking about this since 2020. And I remember Klaus Schwab saying it will be a much angrier world and we're going to see a, a pushback in Rockefeller Foundation's um, 2010 tabletop exercise, which was very similar to like, uh, you know, World Economic Forum, Johns Hopkins Event 201. Uh, they planned out specific scenarios for the future. One of those scenarios being, um, you know, a, a, a global pandemic. And in response to this global pandemic, um, a essentially lockstep global program of totalitarian control that was, uh, I think they said China was the example country of a country that really did so well. I mean, so it was essentially exactly what happened. And they, they do talk about there being pushback and there being a... Uh, you know, I need to censor uh, people, censor certain voices. So what I'm getting at is, yeah, you know, these think tanks, they do run tabletop exercises. It's obvious that when you uh, you look at history, there will be, you know, up, uprising and movements, uprisings and movements to, uh, to push back against these policies. I mean, how much they plan for that? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really privy to all that. I've read a lot of these things like, uh, there's also there's that lockstep uh, step document from the Rockefeller Foundation. There's also uh, the SPARS, S-P-A-R-S. Uh, if you look up the SPARS exercise, it was exactly what happened with the, uh, the pandemic. And it was a few years more in the future than this tabletop exercise. I think it was 2025 it started. And um, they specifically talk about there being adverse reactions to uh, mandatory medications that would get rolled out. And they, they did game this out and said that lower level bureaucrats would take a fall. Pharmaceutical companies would have packaged solutions to deal with the immune compromise issues that happened due to the rollout of these new untested medicines uh, that would be mandated in response to a SARS type um, outbreak. So these things get, they do get gamed out, but I don't, I don't think these, these, these people aren't, they're not omniscient. They're uh, I think to a great extent, many of them are blinded by ideology and there's often infighting in these groups too. I mean, you're, you're really, we're talking about people, you know, who are wanting to seek power and increase their power. So they, they fight amongst themselves. I think one of the, <laughs> probably one of the best scenarios as far as, you know, this stopping would be a little bit of dissent from the ranks and infighting among kind of the, um, the regime that, that has happened many times in, you know, past, uh, in history and that that could be one thing and then we could be you know see it from like a bottom-up resistance that could could stop this and i hope that the, the trucker protests and convoys continue um although you know you know the people who would critique that and say oh it's just going to cause supply chain disruptions and this has already been planned for and whatnot but um yeah i don't know ultimately i'm not i'm not too uh like black pilled on it all i think i think there's there's a lot of hope and i think we do need to push back and i think it might be getting more difficult economically. I mean, it has been for a lot of people the last couple of years. A lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of nurses and doctors have lost their uh, their income. And a lot of people are suffering because of this. So um, yeah, I think it could get more difficult, but I, I think it's kind of a house of cards to a certain extent. Um, and yeah, I, I really don't know how to read it. I don't know exactly how it will play out. I do know where they want to take it. And it's a place where we, none of us want to be. What do you think about, let me just go back to the, the, the money stuff, because a lot of people are concerned about, you know, the digitization of the money, you know, the banks are going to come out with their, uh, you know, their central bank, uh, digital currencies, you know, the, the CBD DCs and, and, you know, there's other people in the cryptocurrency world, particularly the Bitcoin guys who think that one will solve this and, and, and this is a way around it. And there's other people who say that Bitcoin is a Chinese scheme that's designed to also bring in a digital currency they're going to control and steal everything what, what are your thoughts around finance and you know we're seeing obviously the the high inflation of, of the, the currency in the u.s 
other countries, particularly South America, we've seen countries like Venezuela and others that just basically collapsed due to the, due to the finance. But what do you think is going on with the financial world? Is, is it, I mean, are we going to see a shift, a pretty significant shift? Is it, is it for the bad, for the worse? I mean, I mean, Facebook has their own, wants their own currency and on and on and on. There you go. There's some digital identity stuff. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think they do want to go towards digital identity uh, as far as um, what this what this allows. What this allows is, like I mentioned earlier, it's kind of like Pavlovian behavior control using, uh, you know, the, we've got this chart here. This is from the World Economic Forum, and you've got most major countries signing up to these uh, um, agreements, trade agreements, um, you know, agreements from governments and bureaucrats, uh, corporations are, you know, signing on to these agreements to transition towards this digital ident identity system. And, and where I live in Ecuador, what we've seen over the last year is a lot more of this, uh, like if you look at, if I could find this, if you, if you look at the government, well, I don't want to be scrolling around on Twitter or something, but, but the Twitter feed for the, um, I think it's like the, what is it? The Registro Civil, which is like the civil registry uh, here, like the social security, I guess, who would be uh, equivalent to in the US. They are using all the agenda 2030, you know, like the the circle, the rainbow and all this imagery. And it's like, the it, it's all great reset agenda 2030 graphic style on all of their pages. And the language is talking about inclusivity, digital identity. And, uh, you know, these, these are the buzzwords, right? So they use these buzzwords for this new system of oh, central bank digital currencies. Like it's, it, it's going to be kind of like crypto, which sounds cool to people, right? Oh, it's crypto. It's secret. It's like, it's the new thing. It's the future. It's technology. It's progress. It's good. It's, so they're using this sentiment and this uh, kind of obsession with technology and sustainability um, uh, equality and, uh, and all this. And, uh, yeah, this is, it's really about consolidating your digital identity and, and tying your bank account and all banking and all transactions to that, which obviously opens the door to complete control over what you purchase social credit system and all of this. So that's what the, so the social credit system is, um, how Bitcoin, I don't really have a strong opinion on where it comes from. I mean, I, I own some crypto. I don't think it's like, you know, I, I, I kind of chuckle that the, the Bitcoin fixes this. Like people, it's like a meme. They're like, oh, Bitcoin fixes this. You know, it's like, you know, like some starving child in an African mine pulling, uh, you know, pulling cobalt out of the ground so that Elon Musk can put it in his, in his uh, Tesla car uh, or so that the World Economic Forum can force your country to, um, to, to buy a bunch of batteries and, and, and hook those up to windmills. They're going to kill thousands of birds in the name of saving the planet. You know, it's like, it, it's like this meme to me almost of like, oh, you know, Bitcoin fixes this, um, uh, you know, cholera outbreak in Tanzania. Well, Bitcoin fixes this. I, I, I don't, I'm not like a Bitcoin uh, utopianist, but I do think, you know, I mean, getting off of the central banking fractional reserve system is a good thing. Um, you know, a lot of the trends in the crypto world are tied in with transhumanism or tied in with these ideas of body modification and um, like Ben Gertzel uh, and his, what is this project? Um, he, he worked on Sophia the Robot, which uh, Ben Gertzel, he's, he's kind of like this stoner. He's like a movie character. He's kind of like the, uh, I don't know, like the, like the mad scientist in Independence Day. He looks like that. He's like kind of like a stoner guy. He's like, yeah, like, oh, like, you know, we're all just molecules. We could just rearrange all the molecules, man. He was on Joe Rogan. That's what he said. Joe Rogan was like, hey, how do you think we can deal with, uh, you know, some of these problems like overpopulation and stuff like this? He's like, well, we're all just arrangements of molecules. Like just, you know, arrange all the molecules and get rid of a bunch of people, bro. Like he's, he's heavily involved in like singularity.io and some of these crypto uh, projects. So you know, I think, I think there are aspects of the crypto world that are most definitely, you know, moving towards the same ideological uh, ends of technological singularity, um, transhumanism, mach brain machine interface and stuff like that. And then there are a lot of people who are more libertarian and, you know, the, this idea of, you know, financial freedom. I, I, I prefer, I really think that, all right, look, what, it, what is Bill Gates doing, right? Not that Bill Gates is the most rich man in the world. Uh, he's, he's one of the, he's very wealthy. 
I don't think, you know, I don't think he's, uh, he's not, you know, the highest of, uh, of the ladder, or the dung ladder, or the dung pile of, of this world order. But um, Bill Gates is buying farmland. He's buying, he's, he's purchasing land. Um, so I think physical assets, land, um, I do think that is a more safe priority. But of course, that can, you know, that can be confiscated. Look what the Bolsheviks did. You look what, uh, what happened in Romania. You look what happened throughout most of Eastern Europe, the Balkans. Um, you know, it, you're not really secure in, in any, you know, physical way. So, yeah, I think um, crypto can be good. I'd rather own land and livestock than a bunch of crypto. But you can you know, turn the crypto into land and livestock. But it can be crashed, you know. I mean, Goldman Sachs, uh, BlackRock, uh, you know these these kind of global corporate monopoly entities. Uh, they're all owned by you know small group of people, people like Larry Fink, uh, BlackRock, and stuff. I mean, they, these people have their hands in Bitcoin too. Uh, so J.P. Morgan, you know, they're heavily in, in, invested in the stuff. So, and they know how to manipulate markets, you know. Yeah, it's, you know, and, and uh, yeah, that's one of the things I saw about, you know, why is Bill Gates buying all this land? He's diversifying his assets into something he think will hold its value. And certainly land has traditionally been a pretty good, pretty good buy for those people that can afford to do that. You know, the only problem, I guess, like I can tell you, my, my girlfriend's, her father back in Algeria in the 1950s had his land is seized. You know, the government came and said, nope we're taking it and so you can always you know you can always run that risk you know there there's there's one of those things where you know your land is is yours or is long until, until somebody comes and takes it and the government tends to do that let's shift our the discussion a little bit over to food because a lot of people in the area you know, always were in this kind of food carnivore community type thing so um do you feel that uh i mean we're going to be forced to eat a certain way? Do you think that's coming? Do you think we're still going to have freedom of choice? And that, I guess I want to ask about, you know, Ecuador, because Ecuador is a small country. You know, I'm sure the value system is different there. The the, the culture is quite different. How, how accepting are the, 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 the sort of the every man and in, in the, the sort of the normal person in Ecuador at this? Are they are they buying into the into the, the World Economic Forum dream? Are they not? Or Anyway, what, what about food? Yeah, I, I live in a rural area, right? So, I mean, there's a huge divide between rural and city, and you see this everywhere. Um, technology, social media has kind of, um, I mean, when, when we first came here, people weren't on Facebook. Uh, there were no iPads and iPhones and stuff. So we, we've seen a big change with like, with tech, with, uh, you know, Facebook, social media. That's, that's really changed the structure of people's minds, people's behaviors, unfortunately. Um, and I, I don't think it's for the better. Uh, we live in a rural area where like most food is produced locally. Um, there are certain things that have to be brought in like salt, you know, there's not a lot of salt up here in the, uh, in the Andes. So we live in a, um, in kind of a temperate, uh, mountain climate. Like when people hear Ecuador or South America, they assume it's jungle, but like there are thousands of little microclimates just within like a hundred mile radius of where we live. So uh, where we live, it's a little bit, it, it's a very temperate climate. It's between, it's between like 60 and 70 degrees pretty much year round. Uh, we've got a rainy season and a dry season. Um, there are a lot of different varieties of maize, of corn, maize that are grown. Uh, people have historically, you know, lived off of local resources. So people have guinea pigs, people have, um, people have swine, people have uh, fowl. Um, we've got cows and sheep here um, on our property. And generally where we live, most people not so into this stuff. Like people want good quality food produced locally. Uh, people live in multi-generation homes with their families. Uh, but in the cities, you know, there's there's been kind of a big, there's been a big uptake of uh, a huge uptake of like the nonsense propaganda, especially the last two years. So yeah, city folk freaked out, masked up, double masked, triple boosted. Um, give, you know, give it to my toddler is the, uh, is the vibe. And I think those type of people, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I grew up in like suburbs and cities. So I'm not saying that like, you know, people in cities suck or anything like that, but Cities historically, you know, they're just they're places where mass propaganda can be spread, where ideologically people are more um, 
they're more easily, they're more mobile, they're more ideologically mobile in cities. And uh, so they will be able to uh, be propagandized more easily. And you do, you, I'm starting to see more in the stores, more of like the fake meat nonsense. And, but I don't, I don't, most people are not buying that stuff here. They're not into it. But this new model that's being kind of rolled out through entities like the World Economic Forum, uh, you know, the, the, the Eat Lancet uh, Commission pushing for global dietary guidelines, the, this new economic model that we see here, uptake and consumption and, uh, and, and markets are not driven by consumer demand. Consumer demand is determined by the market. Right. So if you can raise the price of beef, you can raise the price of animal foods dramatically, subsidize fake meat. This is the only way that you can get people to take this stuff. And, you know, we saw in the beginning of the pandemic, empty shelves, uh, no meat on the shelves. And then the whole fake meat aisle is packed. Nobody's touching that crap. Um, and, you know, if you can if you can brainwash people into taking it. But it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of resources to get us to eat fake food. And people know that, that meat is, people inherently know that meat is more nutritious. Meat is more desirable to all people. It takes billions of dollars of propaganda, um, you know, slaughterhouse, uh, I don't even know what you would, slaughterhouse porn, basically, that these vegans are putting out there constantly. You have to hype yourself up with daily uh, affirmations from, you know, vegan activists. And, you know, you, you gotta have Gary Yurofsky on loop in your mind saying meat is murder, meat is murder to actually not want to eat animal foods. Um, but I think, I think what we have seen is the power of mass media, the power of um, uh, you know, behavior modification using mass media. So um, yeah, that's what we're up against. It's basically, it's a propaganda war against, uh, for, uh, against us and our health is, is the battleground, you know, I mean, They've done studies where like, it's, uh, they've done studies and let me see, I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this, but this was fascinating. Like they, it was the sociology, right? So it's like you know, pseudoscience parading around is hard science. Um, but they take a bunch of poor people and they give them the option, they give them a buffet and they'll always choose real meat over fake meat. Whereas, you know, uh, L, uh, more affluent city dwelling people will very often choose the fake meat over the real meat, right? Starving poor people always pick real meat over fake meat. And this study, they were lamenting, like, and they, they had to justify this. This must be like white supremacy, basically. Like, what is making these poor people want to eat real meat? Oh, it has to be like the patriarchy or, you know, like gender inequality. I mean, all, it's got to be these buzzwords. They can't really, it's like their, their ideology doesn't allow them to see that meat is more nutritious. People want freaking meat because meat's real food. People don't want your trash, uh, you know, nutrient fortified kibble. They want real meat. Yeah, I think I think that's pretty pretty fair to say. Let me ask you know, and and the thing you mentioned, this sort of dichotomy between the folks that live in urban areas versus rural areas, cities versus the country. I mean, as it stands right now, the cities would not exist if it didn't have a large amount of food production in the country and and you know i guess there's people that think that they can somehow change that dynamic somehow and, and you know if, if we if we kind of get all the landowners off the land and, and the, the corporations buy it all and they just turn it into you know basically this corporate controlled area then then they can you know they can control more and more uh, we're seeing you know like I, if, uh, I saw somebody lamenting the fact like for in the u.s there's something called the ncba national cannabis beef association where they're the governing body of not the governing body, but they're they're an they're an organization that's supposed to represent the interests of the beef industry, and they primarily represent the industry interest of the meat packers. To be fit, to be honest, and the ranchers were saying, "Oh, look, beef is demand for the meat beef is coming back up a little bit." You know, we've seen that through the pandemic. It's still way low compared to what it was. And the guy pointed out, "Well, since NCBA took over, we went from, uh, you know, 1.3 million ranchers to 700,000 ranchers. Ranchers are closing. You know, we're we're seeing that, and so it's kind of this continued." of our food system. Um, do you think that is something that is inevitable or is there a way to, way to go to, to sort of push back on that to keep it kind of decentralized, I suppose? Yeah, well, I mean, supporting local producers, right? I mean, if we you know, get in touch with local ranchers, buy directly from the farmer. I mean, that's really, that's really our best bet. 
uh, people, not everybody needs to grow their own food, right? Like I, I enjoy, you know, I enjoy having animals, you know, every morning I get to get up and, and milk the cockroaches, you know, um, no, <laughs> we, we, we've got, we've got cows. So, you know, every morning I get to wake up, milk some cows and, you know, that, that gives us, I don't know, we get like five gallons of milk a day, we got a good amount of food there that we can turn into cheese, yogurt, trade for other foods, right? We've got chickens, ducks, um, we got swine now, we got two pigs, we just got, we just got pregnant and um, oh, sheep as well. So I, I enjoy this, but not everybody has the ability to, not everybody lives in a place where they can, not everybody should live in a place where they can necessarily. Uh, but we can we can support local producers. So you know, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and some of these organizations, unfortunately, they're not looking out for the actual beef producers, right? Like it's like a dollar from every animal sold, I think, goes to the NCBA, and then they use this to market beef from the international market sold in the U.S. U.S. beef gets exported, right? I mean, infamously, the the Australian beef producers they don't even sell their beef in australia right like australian beef doesn't even get sold in australia and they pay they pay much higher prices than people in other countries pay for australian beef so i mean this is the kind of globalized system that's you know centrally controlled the we're not going to stop this by like just nicely asking bill gates to stop buying up all the farmland and squeezing out the farmers using this economic model we're going to the only way to really get around this is to support local food producers um how inevitable is you know further consolidation i think that's really it's up to the consumer's response uh the arrogant people that are implementing these policies see the consumer as an automaton that just reacts to you know mass media propaganda and will basically behave in a predictable way and that computer models can just predict human behavior basically they see humans as a you're a freaking biological computer and if we put a certain algorithm through you, you will spit out a specific response. Um, I, I don't believe that's what people are. <laughs> I don't believe people are just, you know, stupid, uh, dumb, useless biological robots. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think making choices like supporting local beef producers, supporting local farmers, maybe getting involved in cow shares, stuff like that, um, you know, lo lo local uh, barter, right? Local barter, um, you know, building up skills ourselves, maybe even raising small animals at home. If you got room in your backyard, you can have, you know, some guinea pigs, which, you know, they're not the, it's not beef, right? Some chickens, it's not beef. Right? You're gonna, you don't need a lot of land for goats, a few goats, a few sheep. It takes time, right? But, you know, I mean, historically, especially, I mean, you look at the South and there are tons of people who are doing who are homesteading and they they do a little bit in the morning they do it a little bit in the evening and a lot of them have jobs in town right so they're uh you know basically part-time homesteading you can feed your family you doing this and it takes time to learn you know like when i started this i knew nothing and now i know barely more than nothing <laughs> but it's like you know i mean we have a certain amount of food security here i'm able to sit here and sip on my my homemade oatly um no, it's, it's raw milk um but, you know, I mean, this, this is like, you know, supporting local raw milk producers um, and supporting your local ranchers. That's probably our best bet. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a shame when you can access fentanyl more readily than you can raw milk in, in some places, you know. It's insane. The US, so. it's insane. What have you, I mean, and I saw you're making you're making your own cheeses and I assume butter and, you know, the creams and all that stuff. What, what things are you able to do? I mean, you, I mean, as far as, I mean, I'm sure you've got chickens, you've got eggs, you've got milk, you've got meat whenever you slaughter animals. I mean, you're pretty well self-sufficient for the most part, I'd say. You said you mentioned salt. Um, so I'm surprised, actually, you know, I know you've been, you know, eating a at least whole food, a lot of animal food diet. And the fact that you're still alive is, is shocking to me. You know, I would have assumed yeah. that uh, if we were- <laughs> to say, Actually, you know, I mean, you know, I-, I my diet is basically uh, beef and raw dairy. I don't even eat eggs. Like I actually get, I get, I get a little, my, my stomach doesn't handle eggs very well. I don't know what it is. Sometimes I can handle the eggs. Sometimes I don't like them very much. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Diet is basically beef and, and dairy. I mean, I have some, uh, I like a uh, little chocolate every now and then, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna, there's certain foods that I have every once in a while, but yeah, it's just, 
beef and dairy is essentially uh, what I get by on. And I just find that it works for me. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I've done if my if my health starts to go off or, you know, I'm getting like some sort of gut issues. And I always know that, like going to, you know, fully carnivorous, uh, you know, beef with uh, with raw dairy diet for me, that works, works real well. I like honey. We have, we have uh, bees. We produce some honey too. So I do like, uh, like honey. I've been eating that for years. Um, I don't know. It's funny. Like the, what, what I eat now you do see some of the, some of the like carnivore influencers are, are like repackaged. It's basically just kind of Weston A. Price style gaps. I don't know. Everybody's got their own way of branding it. Liver King, the liver King diet, you know, <laughs> but like, I, I do, you know, I like organs. We like, uh, um, uh, I do like liver. Uh, that's becoming like a meme now in, <laughs> in the in the in the uh, online world. How 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 are your kiddos doing with that? I mean, I'm certain I'm sure they're. I would imagine they're just thriving with with, with that. They're great, man. Happening. You know, my son's like a little past five, and he, you know, I mean, I'm not. It's not. I'm not like one of these like crazy coach dads or something. But you know, he squats two twenty five. No, I'm just kidding. He, uh, he, you know, he's, he's five and a half years old and he, like, you see his movement patterns, you see his strength, like he'll just drop down and start ripping out pushups. And they're like, they're like perfect sometimes. So look at, dang, like those are really good pushups, dude. Um, so yeah, he's, you know, they're, they're, they're strong children, very rarely ever get sick. You know, they've had a couple colds. Um, they, I mean, I, I think diet is a huge aspect for children's behavior as well. Right. Like you see kids, they're all hopped up on the, on the juice boxes. And, um, you know, I mean, most kids are really medicated these days, unfortunately too. I remember when my brother was like eight or nine, they, they got him on Ritalin, which ba it was basically prescribed to him by the teachers at school because he didn't behave the right way. So it's like, it's, you know, sadly, a lot of children, they are, they're very medicated. They're taking a lot of these, uh, you know, estrogen mimicking, uh, chemicals, a lot of seed oils and stuff like that. So we, we keep our kids away from that, but you know, I mean, they'll have cake and stuff when they have some bread, but not, they don't live on a diet that's based on grains, but they can, you know, they have some of that now and then it's not a big deal. They know they'll tell us sometimes like, yeah, you know, I had a, I had a couple cinnamon rolls and I don't really feel that good when I eat those. Maybe I'm not going to have those anymore. Like they make, they make good decisions like that, but they eat fruit as well. Um, meat, fruit, um, very minimal grains that like, you know, it's kind of incidental sometimes as a treat, buy them something in town and they thrive, you know, they thrive with no necessary pharmaceutical interventions, you know? Um, yeah. They, I mean, actually they've never, neither one of my kids has, I, I, I can't remember ever giving them any or having to give them any pharmaceutical drugs, thank God, you know, but, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're good. Yeah, healthier than I was up there. Yeah, me too. I mean, similar to my, I mean, I, I grew up on, you know, Cocoa Puffs and Frankenberries and all that, you know, all that, you know I'm surprised I, I survived that. But I mean, you know, you kind of, humans are pretty, uh, pretty hardy creatures for the most part. So we can do it a lot for a long period of time and then it catches up with us. What, you know, are you, are there any sort of, my dog's going to start barking out, painter to shut up. Are there, uh, <laughs> Any red flags you're looking out for, for like, you know, this is something we need to be, be aware of. This sort of takes place. The next step in the, in the, in, in Dr. Evil's plan is, is being, being <laughs> implemented. Are, are oh, you man. You know, I was thinking about that earlier. Cause I figured, I figured we'd talk about that. Cause I remember, you know, last time we spoke was two years ago and um, I don't know, to me, it was kind of obvious what would happen the next couple of years. I, I think, I think one of the next things that we're going to see is more, um, cyber attacks, this idea of cybersecurity is going to become more important. And this digital identification possibly being tied in with access to the internet. So um, one thing that does make sense, you read these people's white papers and you look at kind of some of these, uh, even that like Rockefeller lockstep document, I think there was a, there's a chapter in there, which was not called lockstep. I forget what it was called, but it had to do with cybersecurity. And um, yeah, I mean, the next, the next, step is most definitely looking like a a war you know i mean you look at what we're going through now and this very much parallels kind of world war one um as far as the economic situation the revolutionary fervor what i see this whole great reset as is this is a culmination 
of all the previous revolutions. I mean, this is a high-tech Bolshevik style revolution. We're looking at a high-tech Holodomor style takeover of the food supply. And I think, you know, choking out, strategically choking out in a, in a managed way, certain parts of the food supply uh, could be on the table. I hope not. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, financial crisis is an obvious thing. This is nothing new. Um, it's going to be probably far worse than what we saw in 2008. Uh, you know, we see inflation right now, massive inflation. Um, it seems like war is, uh, is inevitable. Uh, you look at 1917, kind of around that time, what was going on and it, very similar. So I think, I think people, you know, studying the Bolshevik revolution, studying uh, around what happened around World War I is very relevant to, uh, to what we're seeing today. So I think we'll see more deplatforming, more censorship. I mean, this is like kind of all obvious, you know, it's just kind of an acceleration um, of a lot of this stuff. But yeah, I think the cyber, cyber pandemic is a, uh, Klaus Schwab calls it, the cyber, we will have a cyber pandemic and it will dwarf COVID-19. This is probably what we'll see. And it'll get blamed on anti-vaxxers or, you know, um, you know political dissidents. And yeah, I think we'll see more pathology, uh, kind of like pathologizing dissent, you know, like that, you know, these made up uh, diagnostic terms like oc ocu, what is it, uh, oppositional defiance disorder stuff like that kind of maybe like labeling dissidents is basically oh you're you don't want this to happen you must be mentally ill you must be a hate thinker you must be you know patriarch bigot um uh equality phobe or something you know the like kind of pathologizing dissent and, but i don't know i think maybe the the cards may have been a lot of the cards have maybe been played and i think a lot of people are pushing back and seeing how ridiculous this is you know, a lot of people are just like, you know, they see this trucker thing and how Trudeau is out there saying, oh, you know, these are these are basically Nazi uh, transphobes. Like, <laughs> it's like, wait, what? And these are the freaking truckers who don't want to lose their, their income and their lives and their freedoms as human beings. So I think a lot of people are starting to wake up. And um, so, yeah, I would expect I would expect a little bit more terror. But I think people really need I think what we should do is focus on. Like what, what I see you doing, you know, building communities, focusing on strength within the home, the families, real local communities, um, local food production, and, and hopefully moving towards not being so reliant on, um, you know, on big tech's social media portals you know, and I say this while I'm completely reliant on big tech social media portals for, you know, being able to reach people and being able to, you know, continue to try to build towards, you know, at least being a little bit more, um, you know, economically set up with, uh, you know, food production and whatnot. So, yeah, I think it's going to get more difficult to reach people because of the censorship and because of the monolithic nature of the ideology that you're wanting, they want you to conform to. And, um, and we should look out for cyber attacks, internet shutdowns, internet ID, and, um, and, and financial, more further financial destruction. Yeah, it's interesting when, they, when I hear people saying that the concept and, and using the word freedom is considered now far ideology to speak about, you know, yeah. desiring some sort of independence of freedom is considered, you know, like I said, a, a you know racist or whatever type of type of uh, thought so it's kind of yeah this is, i mean it's like any that's the worst thing that you can be now is 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 intolerance right but uh so yeah it's anybody who who has some some sort of opinion that's contrary to the regime like you saw like they try to take down joe rogan and make him bend the knee uh, you know by compiling out of context clips of him you know saying saying the the naughty word which is you know they, they they turn these words into like magical sigils almost where it's like it has this magical power where like if you say this word then the bad things are going to happen and it's um yeah I, th I think we're going to see more weaponization of language like that like you know farmers markets are places where you know they're like this was a couple years ago where they were saying farmers markets and it was like the atlantic or something fortune magazine maybe farmers markets are you know hot hotbeds for 
uh, white supremacist hate speechers. <laughs> it's just like, you know, so and, and your farmer's markets are bad, you know, raw, raw milk, you know, milk is a, is a symbol of like, of the patriarchy and of, and, a, and of white rage. Like, so it's just stupid, ridiculous things like this that I don't know. It just seems like a parody of itself. So I think you know, that could work to our advantage, hopefully, <laughs> that, they, that these people are just so corny and stupid. You probably saw that little Oxford debate that was put online with a, a crazy woman that wrote uh, the, the, polit the sex, sexual politics of meat. I can't remember. Carol Adams, I think she, is her name. And she came out there with this absolute gibberish nonsense about how eating meat, uh, you know, indigenous tribes never ate meat. Their native diet, diet was vegetarian. And we've the, 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 the British colonizers forced meat upon the populace or some, you know, in, in a, in a <laughs> way and you know in climate change is 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 is, is, is sexism and it's just bizarre where they it's like how many buzzwords can you fit into like one seven minute speech how many how many loaded buzzwords can you fit into it? it's like that's what academia has become it's just a competition how many buzzwords can you fit in to you know to, to, to wave the flag of i'm a good little global citizen i say the right things i have the accepted thoughts and, uh, you know, please allow me to get tenured and, uh, and, and keep my job, um, you know, and I, it's, it's so corny. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I like, I love how you, uh, I really like when I can see your Instagram. Um, my, I don't know about you, but my Instagram has been completely, you know, I used to get a thousand interactions on a post and they'd they cut that by about 90% for the last like three months. So my, my Instagram is like dead. I can't even reach people anymore, but I, I, don't I, think I've, I, don't, I don't think I've seen a single one of your Instagram posts in months. I didn't even know if you're still on the platform. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's so crazy. I, I was, I was growing so fast. I got my 39,000, you know, I don't buy any followers or anything like that. You know, I don't have, I don't have like big exposure, but you know, I work pretty hard to build that Instagram and yeah, they, they've just crushed it. I don't know what I did. They said medical misinformation. Uh, and they said, uh, yeah, they gave me a warning, like your content will be basically, they told me I'm shadow banned, which that was a first. So anyways, I like how you're, how you're using the platform over there. I do. I always check out your, uh, your Instagram and I saw you reacting to that video, just eating a steak. That was good. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the thing is, you know, you don't even have to say anything. You just let them be absurd. And, and I, you know, they, they, they self paradise themselves. And it's just kind of like, you know, it's just, it's hilarious to see this stuff. Um, well, let, Tristan, we're, we're about out of time. Let people know what you're up to, where to find you, all that good stuff. So, because I, I always, I always, I'm, I'm kind of bummed because I always enjoyed your content every time I thought, yeah, I think you do this. Funny as hell. I, love, I enjoy it. It just makes me laugh, and it's but it's also Thanks, very, very, um, you know. So keep up the good work with that. But work. Thanks, man. Well, it's a shame that you're not able to find the content, and I I get that from a lot of people. A lot of people have told me, "Oh man, I love your like your YouTube stuff," and I I have to resubscribe to you over and over again because they, you know, I've had somebody tell me that they got unsubscribed four times in one week. Um, I don't know. I just. So I, I, I'm going to keep going. You can actually, you can find us uncensored on Rockfin. That's R-O-K-F-I-N. Uh, I am on Instagram. It's at Primal Edge Health on Instagram. If you're going to follow on Instagram, you will get a warning that I am a bad man who spreads medical misinformation and I do not consume enough uh, Oatly and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, what did you call them? Uh, uh, fruity pebbles or whatever and uh so yeah you will get the warning that you should not follow me because i'm a misinformer i'm a i'm a, I'm a bigot i'm a you know progress phobe or something but uh you, hey follow me over there on instagram i uh, i'm not as active there anymore because i've been super shadow banned. you can follow me on youtube as well that's primal edge health on youtube and we do have a website you know the website is a lot more uh google algorithm friendly a lot of recipes over there and you can check out our uh, our cookbook the carnivore cookbook you can get over there on the website, zero carb recipes for people who really love animals. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I enjoy being able to do what we do. I wish that the algorithms would, uh, would accept my, my penitence. You know, I, I didn't say, I never said the Joe Rogan words, guys, what's up with this? I, I, uh, I, I have said Joe Rogan a few times, I guess maybe that's illegal now too. Just saying Joe Rogan, I guess will get you put on some sort of a list, but, um, <laughs> yeah. 
as primaledgehealth.com and and the instagram's always always popping with good memes and stuff but yeah it's like super shadow man territory and but rockfin oh, is I, the I, place I, to go that's the best place oh. rockfin r-o-k-f-i-n and that's tristan haggard over there on rockfin and that's all uncensored and stuff so you gotta get gotta get all you guys over there on rockfin you can sign up for free most of the content is free over there and then there's like paywall content that's uh you know behind the paywall the premium content most of it is free so yeah you guys definitely check me out over there i gotta try to get i gotta try to convince dr sean baker over here to to come on for i I got a bunch of questions for you because it's been interesting you know following you and again like i'm not just tooting your horn uh but i i do always enjoy your stuff man and it's been nice seeing you you know speaking up and I know you're not you're not working in a hospital, uh, but it's nice to see people with you know the the doctor on the name actually you know having some integrity these days. It's very rare. Uh, well, I appreciate it, Tristan. I'd be I'd of course be happy to come jump on chat with you anytime. So let me know how to you know hook up with you know send me a message. I'm like we'll make that happen. So anyway, guys, thank you very much. Tomorrow we got Dr. Ted Naiman coming in for his reschedule. So it'll be a different, definite shift in, in content. So good though. I enjoyed this a lot. All right. Take care, everybody. Take care, Chris, Tristan, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon, man. All right, man. Thanks a lot. See you.